let me introduce uh, Renee. Uh, she's kind of our inspiration. Uh, her columns really motivated us to, to be here today. Uh, she's an associate editor and columnist for the Boston Globe op-ed section. For over 30 years, she's worked uh, as a pop culture columnist, arts writer, and critic at the Boston Globe, WBUR, and Boston's NPR. Her articles have appeared in, in the press nationally. She's consistently worked to explore and describe the complex facets of living while black in the United States. And uh, we're, we're very honored to have her here today. And I'll, I'll ask Renee to introduce the remaining panelists. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on something that was said in the, in the earlier panel that, you know, there's a drug that can make people less prejudiced. <laughs> can we try it for a year, <laughs> starting in the White House? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as Bob mentioned, I, 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 I wrote about an incident in, in April um, when uh, two young black men at a Starbucks in Philadelphia were arrested for essentially being two young black men at a Starbucks in Philadelphia. Um, and, the, and the column was called, It's Not Just Starbucks, White Fear is an American Problem. Um, and that's why we're here today. We're here to talk about this idea of irrational white fear and the effects it has on, on people of color in this country. And we've got a really great panel here to, to do that and help us do that this morning. So I want to introduce them. Um, on my immediate right is uh, Carl Takai. And if I'm mispronouncing anyone's name, please uh, correct me. Um, he's with the American yeah. Civil. Oh. Rhymes with OK. So. OK, this, <laughs> yeah. there we go. Carl uh, Takai um, with the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, he is a senior staff attorney at the ACL's, ACLU's Trone Center for Justice and Equality. Then we have Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. She is an obesity medicine physician and scientist at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And then we have Paul Marcus, who is a white anti-racist activist, educator, and consultant, and he is the lead trainer at Community Change Inc. in Boston, uh, Massachusetts. And so we're gonna start with uh, Dr. Stanford. Good morning, everyone. Oh, that's not enthusiastic enough. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Excellent, excellent. So um, I'm here to talk about a recent incident that occurred on Delta Airlines flight DL5935 out of Indianapolis back into Boston on October the 30th. Um, on that flight, I do travel quite a bit. I'm the only person in the United States that is currently trained in internal medicine, pediatrics, and has completed a three-year obesity medicine fellowship. I am dedicated to the care of persons that have this disease that is called obesity, which affects 40% of the US adult population and 20% of the pediatric population. I had just gone to some routine meetings um, in Indianapolis and was on a flight coming back into Boston on Oct the evening of October the 30th. Um, approximately 15 minutes into the flight, the woman directly to my left, so I was seated in um, seat 9B, this woman was in 9A, began to convulse and to hyperventilate. Um, I think that it would have been within any human nature to immediately respond, but um, secondary to the fact that I've spent 17 years post-college doing training um, specifically in medicine, I immediately responded to this woman that was directly to my left. After I did my immediate response or responded to her trying to figure out what was going on, the first flight attendant, we'll call her flight attendant number one, um, who happens to be a white woman, came to me and said, well, are you a physician? I said, absolutely. I happen to carry my medical license adjacent to my driver's license because I often r recognize that people do not see me as a physician when they look at me for face value, and that just is what it is, and so I do carry my license. So I handed to her quite abruptly as I'm trying to also stabilize the patient. Um, she takes a look at it and then walks towards the back of the plane. Um, within a few, I would say within a minute or so, the second flight attendant approaches me and asks me, um, can she see my license? Since it was readily available, since I'd given it or volunteered to give it to the first flight attendant, I just gave it to her as I'm still trying to stabilize the patient. 
She takes the look at it for a little bit longer, so about five to 10 seconds as opposed to two to three for the first person. It is a medical license that is here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, since that's where I practice medicine. Um, she takes a peek and then she walks towards the back of the plane. Um, I'm now recognizing that this patient is having a panic attack, getting her settled, recognizing that maybe I do need to give her a bit more space. I'm in the process of transferring seats, giving her my aisle seat so she has a bit more space and um, time and just feels a little bit more comfortable because she feels quite claustrophobic in this, what I call a puddle jumper type plane from Indianapolis back into Boston. At which time, um, both flight attendants approach me and flight attendant number one asked me, are you a head doctor? And I said to her, um, I'm not certain what you mean. And then she repeats the question once more and says, are you a head doctor? I said, you know, I, I don't know what you mean. She says, are you an MD? So well, I'm confused about why you're asking me that because you just looked at my Commonwealth of Massachusetts Board of Registration and Medicine license, which clearly delineates that I am an MD. Then the second flight attendant asked me, well, is this really yours? So um, it's interesting because it says my name, which is Fatima Cody Stanford, MD. Um, the last time I checked, there were no other Fatima Cody Stanfords in the world. So um, I don't know if I was an imposter, an imposter for my own self, um, but that's the question that I was asked. Um, we had a two hour flight into the Boston area, during which time I was able to get the patient very calm. I recognized that what really calmed her was just listening to my voice, isn't it soothing? Um, so I was able to, to soothe her with my voice. Um, when we were making our final descent into Boston Logan International Airport, um, flight attendant number two approaches me and says, I just wanted to let you know, we don't need to see your medical license again. You seem to do a good job with the patient because of course she has significant expertise in this area. Um, and then as we were exiting the plane, um, the patient was directly in front of me. I get off the plane and she says, well, are you sure she's okay? I said, yes, she's okay. And I worked to get this woman to her next flight. She was a international passenger traveling back into France, but had to connect into Amsterdam. I got her to her next gate and she stated to me, as soon as we got off the plane, I could not have gotten through that flight without you. Now, what I thought was quite interesting about the experience was that not once did the flight attendants ask the patient how she was doing. The focus was whether or not I was who I said I was, despite the idea and or concept that I actually have four degrees, have done two residencies, and have done two fellowships, and I'm on faculty at Harvard Medical School. So that is what brings me to this panel today. I, th I think I'm kind of immediately struck by the idea that you always carry your medical license with you, which is not something I assume doctors felt the need to do, um, which very much speaks to this idea that you don't expect to be trusted mm -hmm. when you say that you are a physician. Absolutely. And had you had that experience before? No, but um, what's very interesting about the experience and the timing of this particular experience was um, two years ago on a Delta airline flight, there was another black woman physician by the name of Dr. Tamika Cross, um, who was a resident physician at the time. I can't remember where she was traveling from and to, um, but there was a medical emergency and she spoke up and said, you know, I can help and was not allowed to render care because they did not believe her to be a physician. She worked with Delta Airlines over the next year and a half to change their policies surrounding diversity. But it's when that incident happened, I noted to myself that I need to just carry my license at all times. Now, what's very interesting about the timing I stated was that at the Massachusetts Medical Society on October the 19th, meaning it was this was October 30th, on October the 19th, we did an entire conference on bias and gender in medicine where we flew in Dr. Tamika Cross and I interviewed her on the panel about her Delta Airlines experience as our keynote speaker. Um, so it was very interesting to be in the same situation literally two weeks post that event that had occurred at the Massachusetts Medical Society headquarters on bias and gender and medicine and how we face this issue as physicians. It's interesting because when I, when I heard your story, I asked a, a good friend of mine who's a, a white doctor, I said, do you, do you carry your license? And he said, well, no, why would I do that? Who would believe I'm a doctor? And he's like, and who would pretend to be a doctor? And I thought, well, exactly, and especially in the case of a medical emergency, what idiot would stand up and go, oh, no, I'm a doctor, yeah. and then not actually be one. Not a good 
what was the response from Delta? So I'm going to give you the direct response, response to Delta. I've seen many other things in the media. Delta spoke with me the next day. I was on a flight. I was, I was scheduled to go on to Pittsburgh the next day, but not on Delta. Um, and I was in the airport talking to them, and they were like, well, you know, Dr. Stanford, I just want to let you know. They, the flight attendants just wanted to make sure you weren't a therapist. Not sure where that ever came from, but I guess that was the head doctor portion of things. <laughs> um, number two, um, they are working at this at the highest levels of the company. Um, number three, they wanted to thank me for being a Delta Sky Miles member. <laughs> and number four, um, they wanted me to fly Delta again soon. That was the direct response to date that I have received from Delta Airlines. I have not received a bottle of water, although thanks Harvard Law School for giving me this bottle of water. Um, I have not received any other formal communication. I can tell you when I watched NBC Nightly News or looked at the New York Times or any of the other, you know, CNN, I know you spent a lot of time on CNN. Mm -hmm. I see other responses that Delta supposedly has made to me. I can tell you that none of these things have directly come to me. Um, I can also speak that um, medical organizations, much like the American Medical Association and the National Medical Association, have, 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 get, have gotten written responses back after sending letters on my behalf as active members um, and national officers within those organizations. But I have yet to receive anything else disp um, in addition to that communication mm -hmm. the day after. What do you think would have happened if you hadn't had your medical license? So, you know, I've tried to play this out. I've tried to figure out, like, what could I have done differently, and then what would have happened in a situation where I didn't have it? Well, I think that they were in somewhat of a predicament because the patient was directly to my left. So I would, there were no additional seats on the plane, so they couldn't move me to somewhere else unless they wanted me to sit in the cockpit, um, which I don't think they wanted me to do. Um, so, I, you know, I think I would have continued to render care, and they would have continued to, I think, hover over me. Um, there, were, um, there was a physician actually in a row ahead of me, but he is not um, licensed to actively practice in Massachusetts. I think he may have been called upon despite the fact that he is not actively practicing as a white male physician um, here in Massachusetts and is now more on, on the pharma side of things. You know, so it's, you know, it's a bit of a conundrum for me to kind of, you know, decide what would have happened, um, especially since she was immediately to my left as opposed to me, like, going up to another row to render care. I think they would have just had to let me do what I was doing. I think it's interesting that it, it plugs very much into what we heard earlier from Professor Williams about this heightened vigilance, mm -hmm. that you're always thinking ahead on how people are going to react. And that does have an impact. Absolutely. Like, you want to go on about your day, but you have to think about what you might encounter along the way in a way that lots of other people don't have to. Absolutely. And I can tell you many of my white male colleagues have come out much like, I guess, this person that you were speaking to and said, I have rendered care in many situations, whether it's on airlines or in public places, um, and have never once been questioned about um, whether or not they were a physician. One, actually, a gentleman came up to me at the American Medical Association meeting, which just concluded this, um, on this past Tuesday, and said, you know, I was on a plane, I had ripped jeans, you know, I had not showered, I think my breath smelled badly, um, and I, you know, got up to respond to a patient, and the flight attendants immediately said, okay, doctor, you know, we'll allow you to do whatever, and so he was just bewildered by the fact that, you know, despite all of these things that I really tried to, to mitigate these issues, that it still was, was what happened. What's the upshot for you? What, what's, what's the message you would say to other physicians of color? So the, the reality is, is that I don't, quote unquote, look like a doctor. Um, and so the hashtag, what a doctor looks like, has been trending on social media where persons of color, persons of sexual minority status, et cetera, have been posting pictures to show what a doctor looks like. And I think people do need to see persons like myself. People do need to see those images of persons that have done just as much training, if not more, than many other individuals and recognize that we do have value, we do have strength, and we should be recognized and acknowledged for the training and time that we've taken to engage upon this endeavor, which is medicine. I think the last thing I wanna ask you is, let's talk about you sort of keeping your cool in that moment. You know, you had every right to go off, you know, even though this woman was in distress, but I mean, you know, they were coming at you in a, in a really offensive way. Talk about the need to sort of keep your cool and how you did that and why you did that. So for me as a physician, the first priority is always the patient. I was perturbed definitively throughout the course of the flight, um, but 
I could tell that any time I got tense, the woman who was the patient to me got more tense and began to respond negatively. So even in my responses back to the flight attendants that I stated to you, you could tell that this was not a good experience for her. So my goal was to fo first focus on what I could do to minimize her reaction because I can't control that while we're in the air. I used that to kind of guide me because I was quite frustrated and um, felt belittled, demeaned um, with regards to my abilities to deliver care to this patient. I felt very capable of doing so. And so that's, that's really kind of what I used as my guiding principle throughout the encounter. Your professionalism prevented you from saying, you know what, just take care of it yourself. Right. I'm I mean, because I don't do think, well, they never asked her. They still, I right. think they still. Well, it feels like they, they spent more time worrying about your medical license exactly. than they, they did the health of this patient. Absolutely. And it was, it's, it's disconcerting. Um, and I, you know, to hear the patient tell me after we got off the flight that, you know, I could not have gotten through that without you really reaffirmed what I was using as my guiding principle to keep my cool under pressure. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I'm up next. <laughs> so much talking. Okay. Um, in one of his stand up routines, uh, Chris Rock says, I was born a suspect. All black people are born suspect. Then he details all the ways that white people wrongly profile him as a criminal and simply because he's black. And then he says, and I'm, I'm apologies to Chris Rock, I'm gonna blow this joke terribly. I look up in the window and there's a bunch of old white ladies and they'll get on the phone and they'll dial 9-1 and just wait for me to do something. This routine is called Born Suspect, and it's hilarious. But then after listening to it, I realized he first performed that more than 30 years ago. And every last word of it still applies. Nothing has changed. Great comedy always holds more than a morsel of truth, but the truth this time is unbearable. Long before Barbecue Becky and Permit Patty, this has always been the reality of black lives, being viewed as suspect and as suspects, even when performing the most mundane, ordinary task. Driving, walking, shopping, playing golf, napping in your dorm's common space, sitting in Starbucks, living while black. A white friend once asked me why black people suffer hypertension at disproportionate levels. And at first I talked about diet and family history, less access to, to healthcare, and then I just stopped and said, racism, it's really stressful, you know? What does it mean to live under constant scrutiny? Even when people of color aren't actively thinking about it, subconsciously, it's always there. I'm always aware of what I'm doing when I leave the house and wary of anything that might arouse suspicion. Of course, this is the losing proposition. My existence, my blackness is what invites suspicion. And that's the way it's been in this country since its inception. White people, and not just white people, are predisposed to believe and react to the lie of inherent black criminality, a myth fed and nurtured by white supremacy. In April, as I mentioned earlier, I wrote a column about the two young men who were arrested in Starbucks. A lot of people at that time got really mad at Starbucks, and they wanted to boycott Starbucks. And I kept thinking, okay, you can boycott Starbucks, but that's, not, that's letting America off the hook. A boycott would not have addressed issues far bigger than one coffee shop in one city on one day. On the day I heard about it, the first line I scribbled or what became my column was, to be black is to always be in the wrong place at the wrong time because in America, there is never a right place for black people. The problem is America, it's not Starbucks. When Starbucks CEO appeared on Good Morning America after the incident, he called what happened to those two young black men reprehensible. GMA host Robin Roberts called the incident a teachable moment. And all I could do was roll my eyes. This nation has had several centuries worth of teachable moments, and still white people think a black man walking to work with a duffel bag is cause for alarm and police intervention. I don't know what white people get out of teachable moments, but here's what black people learn. Be on high alert. Don't reach into your bag or pocket. Don't walk too fast. 
Don't walk too slow. Don't allow your child to sell water on a street corner. Don't barbecue in the park with your friends and family. Don't take a nap in a public space, even if you have every right to be there. Don't enter your home. Don't open the doors to your business. Don't be unfriendly. Don't be too friendly. Every breath we take is cause for white fear. And that irrational fear endangers black and brown lives because white people are quick to call for backup. That's the police. And we know when police arrive, there's reason to fear that your name could become the next rest in power viral hashtag. Social media amplifies white, these white fear moments, but they don't cause them. That's a distinct disgrace of a country that for centuries has systematically dehumanized, diminished, and demonized people of color. In his extraordinary award-winning book, Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, Dr. Ibram H. Kendi writes, from the arrival around 1619, African people had illegally resisted legal slavery. They had thus been stamped from the beginning as criminals. In all of the 50 suspected or actual slave revolts reported in newspapers during the American colonial era, resisting Africans were nearly always cast as violent criminals, not people reacting to enslavers' regular brutality or pressing for the most basic human desire, freedom. In many ways, we're still agitating for that freedom. And in attempting to exist in peace, to exercise that freedom, we're punished for it. We can be locked up, or much worse, for daring to behave just like everyone else. The reasons behind white fear are false. The consequences are very real. It's time for them to be addressed and eliminated. As Bob Hernandez said earlier, racism has a disruptive impact on all social interactions. There are entrenched systems that must be acknowledged and dismantled. Today we hope to do our part to move the needle forward, to share, to strategize, to educate, to be accountable, to hold others accountable, to treat the disease of systemic racism and not just the symptoms that ail too many of us every day. Thank you, and thank you for being with us here today. And now, we'll hear from Carl. Thank you. Um, so uh, the work that I do at the ACLU is about uh, police practices writ large in the United States. Um, but one of the areas that we have been focusing some attention lately is um, the issue of um, these sort of white fear driven calls to police. Um, and there is one thing that has changed over the past 30 years, and that's the existence of these, which forces white people looking at these incidents to view them through the eyes of the black people who have been targeted rather than through the lens of a police report or um, you know, through, through um, a, a description that's been filtered in ways that diminish the impact of that experience. Um, and I think that that's why so many of these incidents have captured public attention in national media in a way that they have not in the past. Um, and this is something that goes to some of the deepest roots of policing in America. Uh, the, the story that's often told about the origin of uh, city and urban police in the United States is that it is an import from um, the London Metropolitan Police. Uh, Sir Robert Peel was the first person to professionalize police forces in Britain, and then that was imported to Boston and New York uh, by uh, you know, a, a new wave of police chiefs in the early and mid-19th century. Um, but, but that description of the history ignores the other major origin of city policing in America, uh, which is a story that begins in Charleston, South Carolina, where rural slave catchers evolved into an urban police force whose primary task was uh, to act as an extension of that rural slave catching machinery uh, to patrol the streets of Charleston to ensure that escaped slaves could not continue to uh, you know, walk through the streets and to ensure that um, 
people who were still under slavery and had not escaped could not organize, could not meet, uh, could not um, you know, carry out the tasks necessary to organize either uh, an escape or a rebellion. Um, and the use of police to weaponize white fear calls back to those Charleston origins. Uh, Lolade Cianbolo, who's the graduate student at Yale, who had the police called on her by a fellow grad student because she was sleeping in a common area, described it this way. This is about showing our right to exist in space, our freedom papers. And um, I, I think that cuts to the core of the issue. This is, you know, when a police officer ejects a black or brown person from public space purely on the say-so of a white person who is motivated by racial bias, that police officer is enforcing that racial bias. And so when police officers allow themselves to weaponize these biases, um, that means that they put black and brown people at risk. Um, they send a message that black and brown people must accept living as second class citizens. And they undermine the legitimacy of the police precisely because of the ways in which this echoes the historical role of the police in enforcing slavery, segregation, um, and the continuing oppression of black and brown communities in the United States. Um, from a police practices lens, the way that I look at this is um, there's a twofold reason about why police keep acting as the instruments of bias 911 callers. The, the first is that um, people keep calling 911. Um, and that is, goes to many of the issues about implicit bias that were discussed in the last presentation. It goes to the issues that Dr. Stanford um, talked about, that um, no matter how much you try to do to mitigate um, the, you know, uh, these issues of perception, it still happens. Um, and, uh, you know, so for example, the ACLU is representing uh, Umu Kanute, who's a student at Smith College, who had the campus police called on her by a campus employee um, while she was sitting and eating lunch in a college common area. Um, and I, I, one of the things that was crushing for her as a 20 year old who um, she had gone on scholarship to a uh, fancy, predominantly white private high school. Um, she's the daughter of a nurse's assistant, and then got to Smith College, which is really the realization of her mother's dreams. In that private high school, she had learned that you wear the uniform. Um, you know, so uh, at the time that she was sitting in uh, the common room and eating lunch. Uh, she was wearing a Vineyard Vines cap with a pink whale on it. This is, if you know, if you've been to any of the Seven Sisters, you know exactly what this this clothing signifies. Um, and this was the first time that the uniform did not protect her. And I, I, you know, it. I think it's it's. Um, So there, there are the, the decisions of people who call the police, uh, despite whatever signifiers black and brown people try to use to show I belong here. Um, and then there is the failure of the law enforcement agency that responds to that call to adopt the kinds of policies and training that would allow them to recognize the way in which they're being used and then change the narrative and change their role in the situation. Um, and there are unfortunately very few examples of uh, police officers handling this uh, in, in the manner that mitigates the harm that, uh, rather than uh, continuing the harm. Uh, in, in Tennessee, for example, there's one example of a man who um, uh, he is a black real estate investor. He goes and visits distressed properties uh, and then tries to flip them. Um, and he was uh, visiting one distressed property 
A white woman called the police on him uh, even after he had showed her his business card and explained what he was doing. Um, and the police uh, did the right thing. They recognized the dynamic of the situation and they actually switched their role from carrying out the bidding of the caller to being his protector and uh, ensuring that uh, the caller would not be able to continue interfering with him doing his work. Uh, and it actually got to the point where uh, towards the end of the interaction, they told the caller, if you keep harassing this man, we're going to come back and we may arrest you. Um, and unfortunately, too many police policies and training don't equip officers to be able to engage in that role switching and to serve as the protector instead of the person who is implementing the will of somebody who's acting on either implicit or explicit bias. Um, and the other point about this is that there are some circumstances on an airplane where, uh, you know, uh, flight attendants don't have guns. They don't have legal authority to kill you. But in the hands of a police officer, white fear can be deadly. And we just in the past week had an example of this outside of Chicago uh, where Jamel Roberson was a black man working as a security guard for a bar. Um, and he was licensed to carry a firearm. Um, and there were a group of men who uh, were ejected from the bar, then came back with guns and started shooting. Uh, he successfully subdued them. When the police arrived, he was on top of one of the men with his gun out and his knee in the man's back, and the police shot him, despite witnesses uh, at the time saying that there had been people shouting, he's a security guard, he's a security guard, and despite witnesses saying that he was wearing clothing that clearly marked him as a security guard. Um, and you have to ask, um, what if he had been white? What would the story have been? Instead of the headlines being about another black man being shot by police, would this be a story about a white security guard being the good man with a gun? I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned, you know, one of the things that has changed in 30 years is, is, you know, the fact that everyone has a cell phone and the cell phones have camera capabilities. In terms of police interactions, what are our legal rights to tape those interactions? Um, so, uh, in Massachusetts, uh, there, uh, it actually, the laws are somewhat more restrictive than in other states, but there have actually been uh, some recent court victories. Uh, so as a general rule in Massachusetts, uh, if you are going to engage in any sort of audio recording of another person, you have to affirmatively make them aware that you, they are being recorded. Um, but uh, as applied to police officers, there have been a series of ongoing challenges uh, to establish the principle that um, police officers do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy when they are doing their jobs because th you know they are on the public fisc. Um, so um, the, the general rule is yes, you absolutely have the right to record. That is a right under the First Amendment. Um, it is a good idea to affirmatively make everybody aware that you are recording because while the police officers may not have privacy rights, other people in the area uh, may have those rights and, and should know that they are being recorded. Right. So them simply seeing the camera isn't enough. You need to say, oh, by the way, I'm recording. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and the one other thing is, you know, there, there is this interplay about, um, you know, you're not permitted to interfere with what the police are doing. Your, your First Amendment right is extended only to um, documenting it. Um, and so uh, oftentimes there's a negotiation of exactly how close is too close to be. And um, that's, yeah, that, that's very dependent on, on the, the particular setting. Right. But you said it, it's more restrictive in Massachusetts than other states. What's the state where it's a little more permissive? 
Uh, well, so Massachusetts is uh, one of, I, I believe, about a dozen states that has uh, the, these two-party recording laws. Um, so in other states, uh, you, you can go ahead and record as long as uh, at least one person in the interaction, so, and you can count yourself in the interaction, knows that a recording is taking place. When, when, when you have one of those circumstances where the police are called um, unnecessarily, what legal recourse do you have? Is there something you, because in my mind, it seems like it's a false police report. Mm -hmm. So what can you do when that happens to you legally? Um, so, so this is pretty challenging. Um, you know, so first, of course, there is well, you know, you're in the midst of a police interaction. And there, um, the problem is, it is an inherently dangerous interaction. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, it, it, I, I don't, um, I don't need to tell this audience about um, uh, the fact that no matter what your legal rights are, um, when you're in interaction with somebody who is carrying a gun and is privileged to use that gun in circumstances that are not permitted for a regular private citizen, um, like it, it's um, oftentimes you you are preserving your life by acting in ways that help to calm that person with a gun down, regardless of whether that's legally right. Um, and regardless of, you know, uh, whether it's appropriate to place the duty of de-escalation on an untrained private citizen rather than on somebody who is paid with public money and receives extensive training from the state about how to carry out their job. Um, moving on from that interaction, though, um, this it gets into a very murky territory because um, of the questions about implicit versus explicit bias. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the ACLU has been trying to promulgate um, policy guidance for the police departments to handle these situations better. Because right now, uh, in many cases, there is this gap. Um, in Philadelphia, for example, um, the, the the focus of all of the police department's policy changes after the Starbucks incident were about making sure that uh, the police would only arrest people if it was clear that the property owner was going to follow through with prosecuting the, the criminal charges. Um, and, and despite the Philadelphia Police Advisory Commission urging them to adopt further changes that would address implicit bias issues and would um, require our officers to take into account the racial dynamics of these interactions. Uh, the police chief pushed back very hard and said, no, we're, we're going to continue adopting what we call a race-blind policy um, to the point where um, the, the Police Advisory Commission interviewed people for its recent report examining the Starbucks incident, and there were high-level police supervisors who said, uh, the, the response to the incident should have been no different even if the Starbucks manager had said, I want to get these two N-words out of my cafe. Um, so that there, there's a serious need for, for policy changes from departments so that they actually um, uh, provide guidance to officers about how to deal with these situations in a way that doesn't just reify racism. You mentioned the case in Tennessee where the police sort of, you know, sort of flipped the situation inside out. Are we seeing any indication that's happening in other police departments where training is changing in the way that they address these things? Um, so as I said, in, in the most recent example, the Philadelphia Police Department has flatly rejected those kinds of reforms. Um, uh, the ACLU is, uh, we're currently, um, running a campaign called Living Well Black on Campus, where we have a model policy for college and university police and security forces. Um, and uh, the, it, um, the idea behind this is that uh, at predominantly white institutions, there's a lot of rhetoric about diversity and inclusion. And 
uh, a lot of efforts to recruit a diverse student body. And so these institutions are being incredibly hypocritical if then once they successfully recruit students of color, they fail to adopt policies that will protect these students from their own police forces. They're all over the pub, they're all over the, uh, I mean, the publicity for the school, yeah. mm -hmm. all over that. Just to finish, I mean, obviously these things have gone on, we're seeing them more because of social media. These things have gone on as long as America has been a country. Is it exacerbated, though, by the current political state of the country? How much is that adding to it in the sense that people feel like they can now step up and decide and dictate who belongs here and who doesn't belong here? Because ultimately, this is always about that. It's about claiming space and making the claim that certain people don't belong in certain spaces. How much has that been exacerbated in the last, oh, how long has it been since January of 2012, 2017? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, you know, it, it's, I think what, what has been the most challenging is that um, under the Obama administration, um, there, was, there was more of a recognition that there could be a, a federal role for providing guidance to police departments about how to do better, um, and that has completely evaporated. And, and that has combined with uh, the, the existing sort of, you know, background of everything that has always been going on. Um, uh, and, you know, so that there's, there's very little impetus for reform for uh, police departments that are not pushed very, very hard to do it by local communities. Thank you, Paul. Paul? Thank you. Good morning. So I want to begin with a, a quote from a friend and a colleague of mine, a woman named Roshana Gray. She said, and I think about living in a place that's chock full of history and devoid of memory. I think about how it's impossible for a nation to have a conscience if it doesn't have a memory. Um, much of the work that we do, we do a lot of education and training um, around New England and around the country. And much of our work is really about expanding the context of the way people understand race and racism. Um, and because it's essential, because in fact, the way that we understand those things have, has profound implications on how we think about ourselves, our relationships, our institutions, and the culture of any system we're in. Um, I have a colleague, Patty DeRosa, who always talks about the idea, she said, everybody has a lot of opinions about race and racism, but very few people know much about it. So in our pre-workshop survey, we ask people to define race and racism in two sentences or less. Just think for a second what you would say to that question. And the vast majority, and we've asked that question now probably well over 10,000 people in some form or another. And the vast majority of people understand racism as something that's happening on the internal and the interpersonal level. Um, two actual survey responses that are representative, I would say, of about well over 90% of the responses. Uh, racism is treating others differently based on their race or a perception of their race. Um, and racism is discrimination based on race. And so we, when we're talking about it, we're talking about something very different. It's not just us talking about it. It's the way it's understood in the social sciences. It's people doing this work all over the country. And so we need to be clear, and, and it's, my under, I, it's my assumption that if I asked that survey in this room, we'd have a wide range of answers and of understanding. Um, and so how can we even have a conversation if we're both using terms and they mean very different things to us? So I just want to start out with a little bit of a framework around it. So when, when I'm talking about racism, I'm talking about the first thing, I, the first words that come out of my mind, is race, my mouth is racism is a system. And it's a system that's created when one group has the power to institutionalize its prejudices and make them part of the fabric of the society in terms of laws and policies and procedure and shape the culture based on that ideology. 
that's a very different understanding of racism than discrimination based on race. And in fact, those two understandings, again, as I said, have profound impacts on the way we think about ourselves and public policy and, and all of those issues. And, and, and that system operates on us, on all of us on four dimensions. It impacts us internally, it impacts our relationships, and I wanna be clear, it impacts not just relationships across race, but race is happening when I'm in all white space. And I'll, I'll, I'll come to back to that in, in a little bit. And it impacts us at the institutional level and it impacts our entire culture. And so all, all of those are operating. And so when we talk about the, the, the health impacts on people of color, um, it's not just implicit, it's, it's not just the direct interpersonal things, but it's, it's systems of oppression that have been created in policies and practices and systems. And we see, as we look at those systems, in fact, we can see, that we look at the outcomes of the health system, of housing, of wealth creation, and all of those things, that, that it hasn't changed or has gotten worse since the end of the quote unquote civil rights movement, since the late 60s and early 70s. In, in almost all cases, statistics bear out a change for the, either it's gotten worse or it hasn't changed at all. I think it's also important to understand that race is not real. Race is a, is a political, social, and economic construct. There's no biological, well, there's a biological basis for our skin color and our physical appearance. There's no genetic underpinning for the groups, the categories that we have created of race. And I think it's very important that, that we understand it. As, as John Powell says, uh, race isn't real like money isn't real. But, you know, a dollar bill has no value unless we give it some value. Race is a, is, is a social construct. And throughout our history, whiteness, and I want to make a distinction between whiteness. There are really no white people. We're talking about a construct of whiteness, as there are no black people in that sense. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a construct, but it's such a deep part of who we are, it's normatized. I actually always want to be careful around statistics around race, racial disparities because they also often tend to normatize whiteness, right? Because it's always compared to whites. And or we have to, we have, I think we have to use statistics, but we also have to be careful because statistics can also support bigoted beliefs, right? The disparities, well, of course, the disparities, look, you know, look at the people. So for example, it's so normatized, I'll give you a few examples. When Toni Morrison writes a novel, it's about race. When James Joyce writes a novel, it's a novel. There's no understanding that James Joyce is raced. And I think we have to have that, that as a white person, I've been taught all my life that I'm an individual white person. I haven't had to think of myself as part of the group, or the reality is a vast, oh, there's a whole lot of people who see me as part of a group, and when I walk in a room, I'm walking in with a baggage of that group that I'm, that I'm carrying in. Um, and so the reality is, is that those of us that are white are highly racialized beings, but we've never had to think of it, right? We don't, it's not, I, I mean, I can give you example after example of asking people about the aspects of their identity, and for the vast majority of white people, race isn't even one of them. And and, and so when I, I live in northern Vermont now, I worked in Boston for many, many years, and when I'm in northern Vermont in the deep north, where it's very white, that is highly racialized space, and race is operating and race is happening. So at the interpersonal dimension, we always think of it, it's just cross race, but it's also race, racism is happening in all white space, and I wanna name that. So that when we use a systemic lens, we can see often, you think often the brunt of racism in, the, in, the, in sort of the common understanding of racism gets blamed on sort of working class, bigoted white people. But if you, if you really think about it, if you think about Boston, for example, if we want to really deal with racism, we don't go to Southie, we go to Wellesley and Newton and the suburbs, because that's where the people who are making the decisions, who have the capacity to make and enforce decisions, who, who can determine resource distribution, who can shape the culture, that's where those decisions are being made. Um, the other piece then that I wanna just quickly mention, and, and it was mentioned in one of the questions at the end of the last session, I wanna just name white supremacy. And I wanna name white supremacy as a system, 
And we talk about white supremacy as a system of economic and social exploitation, domination, and marginaliz marginalization of those constructed as people of color or other than white. So white supremacy is about dominance. Um, it's built on what Dr. King called the three evils of economic exploitation, militarism, and violence, and racism. We, people came to this country, they wanted stuff, right? You can't take people's stuff without violence. They're not gonna give, they wanted, they wanted, they wanted stuff and they wanted labor, and that, in order to maintain that, that takes violence. And in order to justify it, we created a system of racism, right? Race exists because some people had the power to create it. Um, it's interesting, my colleague, my co-trainer Donna Bivens makes the parallel with those triple evils to the three poisons of Buddhism that keep us from enlightenment. Um, exploitation, it, greed, um, militarism and violence, hatred, and um, racism, delusion. So we have, this, we have this system of delusion. And we've, we've had hundreds of years of this system being built. Um, and the only piece he published, Thomas Jefferson, in the notes on the state of Virginia, posited that blacks are inferior, but it was up to science to prove it. And that sets off um, decades and decades of race science. Much of the history of anthropology is about proving white, su white supremacy. Um, so we have a nation that's built on the enslavement of African Americans and the genocide of the indigenous people. And that's been justified deeply through science, through religion, through institutional policies and practices. Um, we have a long history that predates the founding of the nation of racism being used as a wedge to keep working class white people and people of color apart. And that goes back to 1679 and Bacon's Rebellion, which was a, a large, major, um, multi-class, multi-race rebellion. They burnt Jamestown down. And very quickly, the, the, the people, the elites in Virginia got scared of that. They didn't want that to happen. They, 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 they knew that the resentment of an alien race would be more powerful than the resentment, would be more powerful than the resentment of upper class Virginians. So we have, a, we have hundreds of years of rich white people telling poor people, poor white people that your enemies are black and brown. And it's why today we see working class white people consistently supporting policies that go against their own interests. And in fact, we're being harmed by those policies. I see I only have five minutes, so I'm gonna skip a few things here. But the, the, the reality is that 85% of those of us that are white live in communities that are predominantly white. We have very little exposure to people of color, and that's not by accident. There's structural, systemic, governmental, um, finance, banking, all, there's all kinds of institutions that have created the racial geography of the country. Um, and so clearly we're, we're not going to break through this by white people getting to know black people and other people of color. My colleague Tim Wise always talks about that. a lot of white people say they have a lot of, they have a lot of uh, many friends of color. And, um, and so for many for him means more than two and as he's looking at the statistics, black people and other folks of color are going to be spending an awful lot of time at barbecues. Right? So, um, so we have this language about wanting to take our country back. And the people who say that, and that goes back to the Tea Party days, and it goes back before that, they, they say it has nothing to do with race. They want lower taxes and small government. They want to make America great again. Well, where do they want to take America back to? They want to, if you ask people, I, they want to take it back to 1955, right, when everything was great. Um, when everything was, was great, everything was, was, everything was in its place. So, you know, not aware that the impacts of Jim Crow that's happening and legalized segregation and lynching and all of those pieces that are happening. So they now see themselves as overtaxed, overburdened by government and that the, the government that's faving quote unquote illegal immigrants and welfare queens. So and, and there's been a transformation in this, actually, because there's been a transformation in the way welfare is looked at. Prior to 1960, think about the way white people were portrayed during the Depression, poor white people, right? Prior to, after 1960, there was, there was a transformation and people began to think that the benefits of government, um, government um, policies and programs are going to majority people of color, which actually is not true. 
And, and in fact, if you look at media portrayals of people of color, uh, of poor people, since the 1960s, it's, it's predominantly black and brown people. So there's a racial subtext that runs through all of these anti-government pieces. And I, I'm, I have some other. It, this has been, it, it's, it's just interesting, the fear, the idea of irrational fear, I find a little troubling in the sense that this has been done very intentionally. Um, so we have resentment. We've been taught that, that inferior, or belief that inferior people without merit are taking our jobs away, as if there are jobs. We've been taught to fear blacks and other people of color, and median reflects and reinforces whites' views of, view of blacks as violent criminals. The majority of whites believe that blacks and Latinos are by nature more violent than whites. We've been taught that white people made our country what it is today. We've been conditioned to see white people as one of the, as the ones in charge and the ones who belong. We, you know, the question, who is the we and we the people? And this leads to deep fears, and it leads to two that are important, I think. It leads to the fear, the fear of violence. The, the, there's a whole long trope about violence, personal violence and violence against women, white women, and the fear of loss of identity. And I want to quote James Baldwin here in, 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 in from The Fire Next Time in a letter to his nephew. He's writing to his nine-year-old nephew, and he says, they, people who look like me, are in effect still trapped in a history which they do not understand, and until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. They have had the belief for many years and for innumerable, innumerable reasons that black men are inferior to white men. Many of them indeed know better, but as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed, and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their, that, their identity. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. You would be frightened because it is out of the order of nature. Any upheaval of the universe is terrifying because it so profoundly attacks one's sense of one's own reality. And the final, very briefly, I just want to mention um, a new book coming out in March uh, by a man named Jonathan Metzl. It's called Dying of Whiteness. And in, in that book, he basically is showing how the policies that are coming out right now are actually literally killing white people in that sense. And I, and I don't want I'm, I'm to, I'm not trying to equate that with the reality that we're talking about here, but what I do want to say is, is that I think one of the ways to get out of this is we need to be having conversations of whiteness because right now whiteness is being framed by the neoconservative movement. And we need to be having conversations of whiteness and the effect of it. And if white people can begin to see their own self-interest in challenging this, I think we can make some strides. Thank you. So Paul, when, whenever I write about, about race, I often write about white privilege. And inevitably, I get lots of nasty emails saying, you know, well, why am I privileged? I mean, my family was working class, and I, you know, don't have anything. What makes me so privileged? Can you talk about white privilege, identify it for people so that a lot of people aren't clear on what it is, sure. and, and how it impacts these issues we're talking about? Yeah. So, yeah, because it's, it's, it's always, a, I ask that question all the time, how many people have had that, how many people have had that conversation with somebody, and how did it go, right? Um, <laughs> So first of all, I think it's important to be clear about what, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about privilege. And what I'm talking about is privileges are things that some people have and others don't, as rights are ostensibly things that everybody has, right? And I'll, I'll, use, I'll, I'll use an example. When I came into this building, now this is Harvard, it's a, I, I know it's ADA compliant, but I, I'm temporarily able-bodied. If I walked into this building today, I want to, you know, if, if I was in a wheelchair, there are barriers that I'm thinking about on a daily basis. Can I get in the building? Can I get upstairs? Can I use the bathroom? Can I negotiate a curb? Is there going to be a ramp? I'm aware of that stuff at some level, but I don't think about that on a daily basis. I don't have to think about it. I have, in a sense, I have temporarily able-bodied privilege. Likewise, as a white person, there are things that people of color are dealing with on a daily, sometimes minute-to-minute -minute basis that, that, that I don't even have to think about. It's not an issue. There may be other issues of stress in my life, but my race isn't one of them. 
I don't have to teach my children um, that if they get pulled over by a cop to keep their hands on the wheel and ask permission. I don't have experience of people who look like me getting shot. I don't get to have experience of, me, of people getting pulled over for driving away white. We don't have experience of white doctors being, having their authority questioned. But there's another deeper piece, and Metzl gets at this in his book, about how privilege is actually hurting white folks, poor, poor white folks, because he looked at three states. I think he looked at Missouri, Kentucky, and Tennessee. He's a doctor and a sociologist. He's an MD, a psychiatrist. And he looked at the impact. He saw the conservative shift in the policies that, of, that I was speaking to, you know, the, the uh, coming out of the Tea Party and now being carried on, on by Trump. And he, and he looked at the, the public health implications of places where those policies were enacted in, in, in three ways. He looked at um, access to health care, the, the ACA. He looked at access to guns. And he looked at defunding education. And he was talking to people in those states, sort of poor white people who were very ill, and he asked them, wouldn't, these are, he said, wouldn't the, in fact, he knew that if the ACA policies were in place, they wouldn't have been where they were. And he asked them about that, and they said, no, we don't want our money going to Mexicans and welfare queens. Right? And so the, the, that at some level, I'm not a wealthy white person, which is exactly what, the, what, it's exactly what happened in Virginia. The, the, house, the, the elites in Virginia, set up policies, there were laws, there were um, um, the decisions, you know, legislative decisions made that said to white people, you're better than them, right? And so the privilege of that status is actually killing white people. He actually had a calculation that showed, and he, did, he spent a lot of time in this, that the white people on average in those states are losing 14.9 days of life because of that. Um, so that, that there has to be a way when, when we, we can begin, how do you talk to an impoverished white person about privilege? And, and there has to be a way to have that conversation because it, because it is hurting them. Um. The flip side of the, of the white privilege emails I get are the, the well-meaning people who say, I'm ashamed of my white privilege. So I wrote a column about that because it's what I do. Um, <laughs> essentially saying, you know, instead of being ashamed of your white privilege, use your white privilege for good. And I, and I use the example of Melissa Del Pino, who was the woman who was in Starbucks that day when the two young African-American men were arrested. She took out her phone and she taped it. And she did it because she knew that nothing would happen to her. The cops weren't gonna turn on her. She wasn't gonna be arrested. She wasn't gonna be hassled. And she was taping what was happening, which is how the rest of us all saw it. So talk a little bit about that. You know, Since white privilege is real, Talk about people using it uh, for good. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, there, I don't know whether, uh, I'm fortunate, I'm not one of those white people who ever, when I started to see this, I never felt guilty about it. I felt, resp I, felt I had a response. Because I, I, I didn't, I was born into this system. I didn't create, I didn't create this. But when I began to so see it and really understand it. I used the term, I, it was like taking the red pill, and the red pill not in the sense that it's being used now, but in terms of the matrix. It, it was like taking the red pill and seeing the matrix, that I felt that I had a responsibility to do something. Um, it wasn't about, I, 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 Malcolm X said that guilt is the most common, least useful of, of, um, of emotions. I, do, I, I, you, I wanted to share, there's an article that came out, I re recommend all folks, folks read it by Michael Harriet in The Root, because white people are cowards. And I want to just share, a, a, if I may, mm -hmm. a, a little bit from that. He said, and most white people don't actively fight to eradicate inequality and injustice because they usually benefit in some small way. The Southern economy was built on evil slavery. Jim Crow laws maintained a national order with white people firmly planted atop the social hierarchy. Systemic injustice keeps black people in their place, but it also comforts white people to know that the big black boogeyman are being kept behind bars. Inequality and racism exist not because of evil, but because of the unaffected majority who put their interests above all others, and their inaction allows inequality to flourish. That is why I believe that silence in the presence of injustice is as bad as injustice itself. White people who are quiet about racism might not plant the seed, but their silence is sunlight. 
Um, he goes, if I may, just a, he goes on to say, many of those people don't speak out because they fear alienation more than they hate racism. For them, the fear of having someone furrow their brow in their direction outweighs their hatred of sending children to an underfunded school, knowing that they don't have an equal chance at success because of the color of their skin. They know the reality of disproportionate police brutality, but they don't have to worry about their children being shot in the face. Their kids receive good educations. Their kids can wear hoodies wherever they, whenever they please. Little Amber and Connor's resume don't get tossed in the trash because of their black sounding names. Their children's futures are determined only by work ethic and ability, and therefore they stay silent on the sidelines. And I think a big piece of that is the piece that people, we were talking about, about the, the idea of lack of empathy, because ultimately, deep down, those of us that are white have been taught that black and brown people are less than human. And I think that that's deep in the fabric of us, and I think it's, it's at some level in all of us. Um, you know, when we look at the Boston public school system, that's, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that the white administrators and teachers who are all well-meaning see those kids, see black and brown kids as their own. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question there in that sense, but so that, you know, there's an old thing we use, it's a, it's a, it's a quadrant, and it shows, that, you know, there's active racists, and it shows that there's passive racists, which is most people, and that there are um, active anti-racists. But the fourth quadrant, there's no such thing as a passive anti-racist. You can't be anti-racist. You can't work. You can't be against oppression without actively working against it. I mean, I think it's interesting. You know, when you use the example of going into a building and wondering if it has access for everyone. The, I think the difference is. If I walk into a building and it doesn't have access, I might think that's wrong, but I'm not benefiting from the fact that it doesn't have access. If you're a white person, even if you're well-meaning and your heart's in the right place, you benefit by these systems that have been in place since really the beginning of American time. So I think, I think that's kind of the difference. I think that's what people don't want to acknowledge, that it's not about you being actively racist. It's that you're benefiting from these systems and pretending that you don't. And so there's this sort of the liberal term underprivileged, right? But what, we, what don't we, if you have underprivileged, what do you have? What do you have, what's the flip side of underprivileged? Yeah, we never talk, we don't talk about that. Right. And that's the, and, and in fact, you, you, it, it's exactly true. I'm, I, I, I benefit because of my race on a daily basis. There's nothing that impacts my life, and I think determining who I am and how I see the world more than this. Mm -hmm. And, um, we have a hit. That's our history, you know. I mean, explicitly and implicitly, um, from the beginning to today. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting. I mean, when I when I came here this morning, this was my first time at, at Harvard Law School, and so you know, I sort of you know walked through the soup and all the slop, and I and I got here. When I walked in the building, there was a young white woman standing, and I suddenly felt the need to announce what I was doing in the law school. Oh, Kai, I'm I'm here for this conference on on race and mental health, and and she was like. Yeah, whatever, I think it's upstairs. Like she had no idea why I was talking to her, but I needed to make clear that I belonged here, that I had a reason to be here. No one did anything to me, I wanna be clear, but that's just the way you internalize this sort of thing. You know, I suddenly thought, well, I'm a black person and I'm, and I'm walking in Harvard Law School and I'm not a student and I know I'm not a professor, so I need to make clear that I have a reason to be here. And my guess is that most white people don't think about that sort of thing. No, it's not, it's not, um, and I think that's part of seeing the matrix. That part of seeing the matrix is, is, is as, as much as, because it's so easy to fall back in the white world, right? Mm -hmm. But part of seeing the matrix is really not giving myself the, um, to, to always, to, the race is always there, and it's a, it's a predominantly, it's a predominant piece of who I am, and it's always operating. It's operating when I'm with all white people, and it's operating across race, and, 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 it's, and it's seeing that and acknowledging that and you know, um, noticing those spaces and naming those spaces and, and not just those spaces but when the reality is when it's boards of directors and it's when it's people in decision making capacity and, and, and noticing that. You know, when we look at, there was a great piece in the New York Times a couple of years ago in the magazine and they actually had the pictures of the power structure and they had the Fortune 500 and it's all white men, a few women, and then a few people of color on the bottom. And they had, they had government, and they had you know, um, media, and they had sports teams. And again, it's, a, it's that same picture. And it's the same picture here in Boston. If you look at the, you know, even you know, if you look at the boards of directors of nonprofits in Boston, 
Um, it's that same picture. But I, you know, in, in terms of class, I can get pretty uncomfortable here. But in terms of my race, I mean, I can, I can even though the class issues, I can kind of walk in here and feel fairly comfortable, feel like I'll be accepted, not have to justify my existence here. Um, and, and the flip side of that is there's something else that we as white people do, which is we deny the lived experiences of people of color, right? Mm -hmm. People tell us, people, people speak to us, people tell us their experience, and we say, oh no, that's not what's happening here. You're right. not, you, don't, you don't understand that. I know your lived experience better than you do. Well, you always get people in Boston who will say, you know, white people who will say, well, I've never experienced racism, so I don't think the city is racist. <laughs> And I always feel like, you know what? I will tell you when racism is over, you can't tell me that it's over. But you get that idea, and there's something about that lived experience. Um, when there was an incident at, at Fenway Park last year where a player from the Baltimore Orioles, someone screamed the N-word at him in, in the ballpark. And it was a whole big hue and cry, and you know, Mayor Walsh in Boston was saying, oh, this is not who we are, and it's like, no, this is exactly who we are. <laughs> and, there was this whole sort of thing about it, and I sort of wrote about it, and people kept going back and forth about whether this was legitimate. And at one, person I, at one point I said, if I told you I was in pain because you can't feel it, would you deny it? And that's what it is. When I've come to someone and say, yeah, this thing happened to me, and they kind of, you know, oh, well, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Well, how do you know? Do you deal with this? And in most cases, the person who's saying that has not dealt with it. So I think that's a really important part of it. Listen to people. The same way that we have these, we've had these discussions since the, you know, the big arrival of the Me Too movement that men need to listen to women. You know, white people need to listen to people of color about these experiences. We're not you know, sort of running around trying to make these things up. You know, so we'll have stories to tell at the end of the day. These are real things. And you know, it's not just impacting people of color, it impacts everyone, and that's part of the problem of racism. I don't know that white people understand how deeply it affects them as well. You know, when the Globe, uh, as mentioned earlier today, did that series about race in Boston, I had to you know, write a piece about it afterwards, and I, and I said, it, racism is the sense of you go through life with one arm tied behind your back. And why would any society want to carve out and, and throw away large portions of their, their community and discount them when you have people who can contribute and who can help, but these systems keep them from doing that. I think we want to take some questions at some point. Yeah, let's take some questions. So I guess my question emerges from a struggle that I'm having. And I'm struggling with the, the framing of the issue as being one of fear. And so what I wanted to ask you all is whether it's possible that fear the, the story called White Fear is really an alibi to mask aggression, which is what all of these things you're describing are really about. They have nothing to do with being scared. They are about being on the offense, and I don't mean in an emotional, like, you upset me, like, war. Offense against a targeted group of people. And fear is the story that you tell afterwards to say, well, this is why these otherwise good people are acting so aggressively. Thank you. Anybody? Anybody? You know, I think it's both. I think it's absolutely a combination of both. I do think there are levels of aggression that are informed also by fear. You know, this person, why are they in my neighborhood? Why is, you know, there have been several instances during the primary season in, in other states of candidates canvassing neighborhoods and cops being called on them. You know, now that can be aggression, but I think there's also levels of fear. But I think, you know, with the way this country is dealt with race, it's all kind of this sort of terrible, toxic stew. Um, so I think it's, I think you're right. It's both. I don't, I don't know that I think fear is, you know, the nice way of talking about aggression, but I do think it's both, and I think they're both just they're both equally toxic. Um, I'd like to respond also. I do think it's both. This panel, I'm trying to choke back tears the entire hour and a half that I've been here because every person that spoke brought up experiences about every day of my life. But I do want to speak about an experience I had my first week of college as we talked about institutions. Um, I was an Emory scholar, so I was on a full tuition scholarship at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And my boyfriend at the time, who is my husband, currently um, was in my room on a Friday evening um, while we sat in our dorm room. We get a knock on our door from the Emory police 
Um, and they say to me, oh, you know, hi. I'm like, hello, at about 7 o'clock on a Friday evening. And they said, well, do you have anyone in your room with you? And I said, yes, I have my roommate and my, my boyfriend is here. Do you mind if we speak with him? Okay, well, I don't know if I can say no, but okay, you can speak with him. So he comes to the door and they said, well, you know, we need you to step into the hallway, sir. So he steps into the hallway and they said, well, we got a report that you have a gun. Um, if, you meet, if you were to meet my husband, he is one of the meekest, sweetest persons ever. He had a Timberland black keychain about this size that he had walked into the building with but one of my um, dorm mates um, had called the police and reported that a black man, he was the only black man in the building, had a gun. They escorted us downstairs, after which we see that they have cleared out the entire dorm, with an exception of my room, which was the last room, so I guess they were trying to contain the situation. And when we walked out the front door of that dorm on that Friday evening, the woman who had called says, yes, that's him, that's the guy with the gun. I don't think my husband's ever been in the same room with a gun. He's had a gun pulled on him in middle school, but he has not personally himself, actually, I guess he was in a room with the gun if it was pulled on him. But I can tell you that that was fear, I would presume. I, that's what I'm just gonna go with, with that. Um, and for me to, on my first week of school, starting off as this Emory Scholar, have this happen to define what became my experience, it hurts. I will just stop there. I would just like to add, that's a, I'm, you know. I'm trying to, not to cry up here. The doctor's never supposed to cry. <laughs> um, I, I, do, I think it's a both end. You know, prior to the Civil War, blacks were often portrayed as docile. And then post-Civil War, when there was ostensibly freedom, they had, there had needed to be control. And then that's where the, the violent image gets really deeply, deeply, deeply built into the, to the mindset. And going with what you're saying, at some level, I do still think it's about individual power over. So it's hard, but, and I do also, I do think there's a legitimate fear. There's one recent one where a guy at a drugstore was having an interaction with a black woman and a white guy, and he called the police, and he was shaking. I don't know if people have seen that video. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is that, that reality. It, it, I think it's really complex to try to, to tease that, but I think, it's, I think it's all happening. I just want to add in that what, what Paul just mentioned. Um, it was a CVS. I forget what state it was in, but she, there was a black woman trying to use a coupon and the cashier did not believe it was valid, and he called the police, and he was shaking because there was a black woman in his store with what might have been an expired coupon, so. Tim, Tim Wise, his friend and, friend and colleague, tells a story. Um, he talks about, it's what you were talking about again, how this hurts white people. So he talked about Colorado, and he said, people in Denver started, the white people, like black people started moving to neighborhoods, and we're scared, so we're gonna move, and we're gonna go someplace safe, we'll move to Littleton, and send their kids to Columbine. Right, and so because, because one of the things that that fear does is it misplaces our fear of where the problem is, right? And, and I, I, you know, we don't name some things in our society. We don't name the fact that the people going postal and mass murders are white men and boys, vastly majority. And we don't, we don't it's not racialized when white people do it. I actually say it all the time. What? I say it all the time. All the time. She so, does say it on CNN. Yeah, yeah. See it. It, 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 so it, it, it's not, it's not rich. Can you imagine if there were black militias being formed right now? Uh, you know, so, I mean, we have to flip that script. Uh, so next question. Hi, thank you all for your comments. Um, I think my question has to do with the fact that I'm having a hard time untangling um, like what it looks like to remove racism from the system and the fact that racism is what built the system. What built the system is erasure of people in genocide and what built this nation is completely like wrapped up in the fact that those things are the founding notions of how this nation was created. In the same way that like, the reason we don't call white um, mass murder extreme because it upholds the system and everything else that like would, like a mass shooting um, driven by people of color or specific religious groups is called extreme because it threatens this system. So I guess my question is, what are we reimagining here? Um, what is the articulation of what it looks like to have a system that doesn't have racism, but also can, like function. So I guess 
like a little bit further than what we've talked about in terms of solutions like interpersonally and systemically. What does America look like without those things? Well, I mean, one thing is for wherever we end up, we're still in America. There's still going to be racism. Um, but uh, one of the things that we can change through um, policies and education is um, what impact sort of, you know, personal racism has, how much it is embedded in our institutions, how much those institutions enable the weaponization of personal racism. And so, yes, like, you know, it, 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 there's a much greater task of addressing um, the, you know, the most embedded structural elements of inequality, but we can continue taking steps that start chipping away at the power of that inequality and the ease with which people can deploy that inequality against others. I, I can't be at Harvard Law School without acknowledging Derek Bell. Um, and after writing a somewhat, um, I don't know, optimistic is the word, book about race, a number of books, he wrote a book called Faces at the Bottom of the Well, and the, and the subtitle was the, um, the Permanence of Racism. And the, the founder and my mentor and dear friend, Horace Selden of Community Change, wrote a response and, and he, he, he said that was, that was, the permanence of racism was freeing for him. It was like an alcoholic acknowledging that they're gonna be alcoholics for the rest of their life and they have to keep fighting against it. Um, and so I just, we, we, know, we, we know, we don't know, if we work hard at this, we don't know we're gonna change things, but we do know that if we don't do anything, nothing's gonna change. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think my question will continue on with the, the question of fear, the previous question. Uh, so I'm, I'm a doctor coming from South Korea. I study schizophrenic delusions, emerging trend of um, schizophrenic patients having um, paranoid delusions, specifically against Korean women, because uh, we started analyzing it as it, the, the phenomenon mirroring the social paranoia against Korean women currently, and people are having an actual fear of being belittled and being taken advantage of by women in general. And that is being reflected on the schizophrenic delusions of the mentally vulnerable. So I'm seeing very much parallel in, in the, the ph phenomena in America with the white, uh, irrational white fear. And my question is, why here are not we, are we seeing these kind of um, materialization through of, of the irrational white fear through the schizophrenic patients or the mentally vulnerable or are we observing it or are there no such phenomena or are we analyzing it? Um, yeah, that would be my question. So I'll just speak from the medical side. Usually when we look at the incidence and prevalence of schizophrenia here in the U.S., most of the people um, that um, are I guess, denoted to have this condition of schizophrenia tend to be young black boys. Um, so I think that it's hard to really capture your question in terms of our context here in the US when you look at the predominant persons that have been diagnosed or um, are vulnerable to this diagnosis. Um, usually it's persons that are between the ages of um, like 17 and 24 that are diagnosed with schizophrenia tend to be male predominantly black males. So um, I think it's, to answer your question, that that's not our experience here, at least upon what we see in the medical system. So hopefully that, you know, provides some insight. Hey, um, thank you. And I want to, so racism is a learned behavior. And we live in an extremely opt-out culture, as in, I bet the people who need to be at a conference like this aren't here. How do we get people willing to unlearn and opt in? Well, you know, so, so one of the ways of doing that is when people are placed in positions of responsibility or take jobs that put them in positions of responsibility, they need to have an understanding of implicit and explicit bias 
and racism. And um, that, you know, that's one of the reasons why um, having that embedded in police policies and training is so important. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, we, we, we can't uh, have the, the population mass medicated with beta blockers, but. <laughs> well, that would cause weight gain too, so we wouldn't want that. <laughs> Um, the, the only thing I would quickly say is that while at some level racism is learned, racism is a system that's self-perpetuating and continuing. I just want to be clear as we think about this, this we need to keep it the systemic understanding of that in, in place. One last question, and then we got to wrap. Thank you. Um, this question is for Fatima. Um, it's more of a personal question. Um, you have mentioned that you carry your license around because you know you don't look the part, um, which is something that I personally can relate to. I'm not a medical doctor, however, I am um, a practice manager, or I was a practice manager at um, Newman Wellesley Hospital, which is predominantly white. Um, I was the only person of color in a leadership role at the hospital uh, during that time. Um, and navigating the workplace became something that was very difficult for me. Um, not so much the work part, but just navigating the environment of being the only person of color, the young black woman in a leadership role, um, to the point where it felt really isolating and was extremely exhausted. Um, so my question to you is, has that feeling of you having to carry around your license to prove that you're a doctor, has that ever affected your confidence? And have you ever felt the need to dim your light to make other people in the workplace comfortable? Very good question. Um, I could speak for a long time. First of all, I love your outfit. It's gorgeous. I did Can need I to mention that this is my license. Oh. Um, so like, for example, casual Fridays when everyone would wear jeans, I never wore jeans because I wanted people to understand that, hey, yes, I work here. I am a professional. I love that. Well, I, you know, I'm going to I'm going to try to give the short answer because I know we have to wrap up, um, but I will stay around for a few minutes to speak a little bit more extensively about this. But um, I, I would say that I've never downplayed my confidence. And I think people that know me in any setting, whether it's a more casual or professional setting, would stay that there's not a time when people might externally question whether or not I'm confident. And I would say internally, I still feel confident. There are times when I've had to minimize myself to fit what people want. For example, in a recent um, talk about promotion, um, which for at Mass General and Harvard Medical School doesn't mean you get paid more, it just means that you get a better title. Um, I was told to shorten my CV. Um, were the talks that I give, you know, can we, can we remove like some of these talks and are these awards like really that important? Or, you know, I know you have all of these things and I felt like a lot of this, if, if I can't be who I am at Harvard Medical School, you know, and can't have all of the things that I actually have done reflect who I am, then where can I do that? And I did have to shorten my, what is currently 71 page CV down to, I think, 48 for people to feel more comfortable. I still would say they were probably uncomfortable with the accomplishments that I have. I can't make you feel better about yourself because I've done more than you. <laughs> I don't think we could have a better ending than that, so thank you all very, very much.